Um, so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. This is how citations and references look right now on the FOSS website. This is a snippet from a FOSS paper. Um, and uh, those numbers and brackets there are references to works at the end of the paper. So you click on one of them, you go down here, uh, and you find this paper with this somewhat terrifying title of, uh, looks like Venom and the Good Life in Tarantula Hawks. I'm not quite sure, oh yeah, how to eat, not be eaten, and live long. Um, I'm glad I'm not a biologist. Anyway, um, so you get a link down there, but other than the terrifying title, it's pretty much an undifferentiated block of text. And then there's three links underneath it. One says view article, and the others have you know, PubMed and CBI, so that's you know a paper repository for biomedical information, and Google Scholar. It's not clear what those three links do, why there are three of them. Also, what are those numbers down there? It's just a bunch of numbers and the letters DOI. I don't really know what's going on there. Also, who's at all? I would like to know who wrote this paper, please. I'd like a full list of authors. I don't know what Ann Zul Fenihi is. It's probably annual zoological, but I, I have no idea what Fenihi is. I, I, Vendicular, maybe? I don't know. And then we've got these three links underneath. Like I said before, it's not clear what they're for. So I think we can do a little bit better than this. Maybe Wikipedia does better. So here's a Wikipedia article on the city of London. What does Wikipedia do? Well, you get a link, you go down there, and it's not really that much better. You can get a link that takes you back up to the text. That's pretty good. But you've also got numbers and some other weird stuff, and it, it, it's just not clear what's going on here, and it's also very clear that they're not all in the same format. So what would be better? Well, it would be nice if we had contextual information, right? It'd be nice if not all citations were created equal, if the reference that showed up 15 times in the work actually had that information attached to it. And you also saw where it showed up. You know, it's always in the introduction, always in the conclusion. It shows up somewhere in the middle. Uh, it'd be nice, it'd be really nice, and we've talked about this several times this weekend already, if we had the licensing and availability information attached to the references. That would be fantastic. I want to know if I can see these things. I'd like to know if there's been any updates or annotations. I want to know if there's been any changes. I'd really love to have the full bibliographic information. I know this is a pipe dream, but maybe the full list of authors is not too much to ask. Maybe the full journal title is not too much to ask. I'm pretty sure that word before was not funicular. And also, it'd be nice to have everything machine readable, which of course it isn't. So, that's what we did. We called it Rich Citations. This is how it works. We grab the paper in question. Right now, it only works on cloth papers, but that'll change. Uh, it finds the citations in the paper. It gets information about those citations by hitting various APIs. And then it returns that information in a structured JSON format. So what can we do with them? Well, there's a lot of different things. Ideally, we'd like to have a giant database of them, serve them up for everyone to do all sorts of different stuff with them. Right now, the first thing we did was just the simplest thing we could think of, which was we used it to make that display of references on a floss paper look less bad. Uh, so first of all, now when you hover over a reference, you get some information right there. You don't have to click on it to go all the way down to the end to see what's going on. Uh, and the information you get, you get a little bit more of it than you did before. There's the old reference on top, and there's a new reference on the bottom, and these are both screen grabs from the old and new references. So now we can see that it's free to read and reuse. We can immediately see what journal it's in, because it's been put, uh, been separated out a little bit better. We get a full list of authors. If you click on and two more, it'll expand out and you get your full list. We can show the abstract. We can show where it appears in the article. And perhaps most importantly, we can see that the article's been retracted, which means that whoever cited this might be in some trouble, though probably not as much trouble as if you would wrote this paper. Uh, and the other thing that we can do is we can sort and filter the references like this. We can take a look, we can sort them by author, we can, short, we can sort them by the number of times that they appear in the uh, article, we can sort them by availability. 
And we can also filter on names or other things that show up in the list of references. So that's pretty good. Uh, and we can also sort along several other axes as well. But this is a screen grab video. This is not as impressive as a live demo might be. So here's a live demo. Uh, another boss paper with another brilliant name, Sexy Faces in a Male Paper Wasp. Uh, I, again, not a biologist or physicist. Uh, so we don't get exciting images like this. But if I hover over right here, I get this. I get the information. It shows up. But what if I do something a little more complicated? What if I go here? Here's references. I think that says 15 through 19. So well, there's references 15 through 19. Uh, they're not persisting very well because I can't actually see the mouse. There we go. So I get all the references I want. And I can expand this. I can see where else in the article it appears. And I can cl click on it and go down there. And if I go down the list of references, I can sort and do all of these other things that I was just talking about. And more importantly, if you do this, you can see the same thing, though it's full of bugs. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so it's an alpha, but you can call it up right now on your computer, and if you throw in a DOI from any floss paper, uh, it should work. It doesn't mean it will, but it should. It seems to work around 90% of the time, which seems pretty good. Um, so that's a great story. Um, but it's not the end of the story, of course. Right now, it only works on floss papers. Right now, like I said, it's kind of buggy. Um, and if you're, if you're worried that I'm about to leave this slide and you haven't copied it down yet, uh, I'll have a slide up with the address a lot longer at the end of the talk. So the talk's not over yet because all is not well. Uh, first of all, we, we have effectively introduced a new standard and of course there's a problem with new standards. <laughs> Some of you may have seen this comic before. Um, the problem with new standards is that now there's a new standard. Um, so we are trying to sort of make our standard composed of pieces of other standards rather than being entirely new. Uh, we're still working out exactly how that's going to work, but it gets the job done right now. Uh, and if any of you have suggestions about how to avoid this problem, we're all ears. Uh, we're also, if, you're, uh, if you are trying out the alpha right now, you may notice that it's a bit slow, uh, unless you happen to be trying a paper that we've tried it on. That's because it has to grab the paper, query, pull out the references, query the APIs, and so on and so forth. Uh, that takes a while. So we're building a database. We're crawling across uh, corpus and we're pulling together all the information and we'll serve it up. The problem is uh, you know, we can do that, but uh, there are other people who I'm not going to name who might be better at maintaining databases. Uh, and if it goes beyond PLOS, which we'd like it to, we'd rather have other people maintain the database. So we're hopefully going to be able to work with Crossref to deposit this information with them uh, freely so anyone can get it. Um, I, I think we're taking questions at the end. Is that, yeah, we're almost done, I promise. I, this talk is short. I love most of the time for questions. Um, so yeah, we'd love to see this deployed elsewhere as well. And the low-hanging fruit right now would be PubMed, uh, because PubMed, most papers on PubMed are in a similar XML format to Floss papers. There's no particular reason why we can't extend it to work with Wikipedia, or near and dear to my heart as a physicist, the archive, um, though that's a bit of a steeper challenge. Uh, there is another thing that we could do, but it would have to change the way that we work as publishers. See, right now, this whole problem, the way I've just described it, to steal an analogy from Peter Murray Rust, it's a little bit like trying to turn a hamburger into a cow. All of our authors are using, you know, citation reference management, and there's, um, there's stuff in the works to create reference management for authoring of Wikipedia articles as well. Um, if we had that information from our authors and contributors, we wouldn't have to query all of the APIs, or at least we wouldn't have to work quite so hard. Uh, so maybe if we can start soliciting a different set of information 
from authors and contributors to all of these different resources, we can actually start making hamburgers out of cows as opposed to the reverse. And uh, ultimately, the dream with all of this is creating an open citation database of the connections between not just all of the PLOS papers, not just all of the scientific literature, but all of the literature, all of it everywhere. If we can put together all of the connections between all of the stuff, we can start building out dependent dependency trees for humanity's knowledge of things. Uh, and, and we can start to understand how and why it is that we know the things that we know. Uh, which, yeah, I, I think that's important. Again, hopefully I don't have to do too much work to convince you that it's important. If you don't think it's important, let me know. Uh, if you do think it's important, then the good news is the API goes live next week. Uh, and we're having a hackathon to work with this stuff in San Francisco in the fall. Details, follow us on Twitter at PLOS Labs, and we'll be tweeting that. Uh, in the meantime, that's about all I've got, so thank you. Yes. Um, and uh, we talked about building it um, within the community, um, possibly as a subproject within the community or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, and we started writing some tools to do it. Yep. Um, the problem, as far as I can tell, is the maintenance of it. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping to maybe integrate that with people actually reviewing their own bibliographies before they submit them for publication. Um, if the community were willing to host such a database, would that be in your mind a good home for it? I mean, obviously, it'll have no data and be so. So the question, if I understood it correctly, was if Wikimedia were willing to host such an open citation database, would that sound good to us? Uh, the answer is hell yes. I think. <laughs> uh, yes, that sounds fantastic. Let's talk more. Any other questions? Yeah. So this is somewhat late. Um, I work with the, the sort of visual editor team, and it's hard for authors to generate citations, and they've been working on citation managers and whatnot. But in your, I mean, do you have ideas on what this would, what the ideal world would look like when you're when you're writing the paper, right? I mean, as a naive thing, everything's got a DOI I number. Maybe I just type the DOI DOI number, and everything magically appears. That's probably not the best way. There are there better ways? Um. So the question was, what would an ideal authoring and submission environment look like, essentially, right? Yeah, like I'd certainly like to see that the paper was retracted if I was about to cite it in my article. Right? Yeah, I mean, so so one of the applications of, of a giant open citation database would be essentially a way of suggesting, not only giving you metadata about these papers, including the fact that they've been retracted, but suggesting more things to cite. You know, think, think of it as like, uh, I don't know, Amazon or Netflix for suggesting citations. Like, oh, you, you cited, you know, Smith, Williams, and Abrams, which you also like to cite Zhang. You know, the, a lot of people who cited those first three also cited the fourth. Um, and that way you stop getting those emails saying, hey, you didn't cite me. Uh, uh, and then research gets out the door more quickly. In terms of what an ideal authoring environment would look like, Frankly, I have some personal ideas of my own about this, but that doesn't count as much for what you find when you go off and do user research, which is one of the things that Floss Labs is lining up next. Uh, so I already answered a question from you, so I'll go back there first. Yeah? Yeah, just a comment on that. Most <coughs> researchers have a reference manager. Yeah. Mendeley, Zoltero, what have you. So all you need is is, is, a, is a little link that says, I want to cite this paper, yes, click, and the job's done, because all the DOI, everything, goes in there. So. Yeah, uh, no, that, so, so the point that was made was that most researchers have a citation manager system, um, which is absolutely true, and that, that does make things easier. The two responses I have to that are that, first of all, not every Wikipedia editor has, has a citation management system, um, and second, not every citation management system, unfortunately, is open. Uh, which, uh, you know, Zotero is Zotero is pretty good. Yeah? Any editors currently using the Visual Editor Studio for data on the English language wiki has uh, an open citation management software through um, Cytoid, which if you type in the URL and you know, will complete the citation for you yeah. using the Zotero library. 
Yeah, uh, Mary Ellen and I went to college together. I think. <laughs> 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 okay, so it's not quite beta. It's not a beta yet. Okay. But anyway, it's further behind than that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Are we finishing, what, 10 minutes okay. early? Sure. Um, yeah. Sure. So I'm kind of curious how, it seems like a lot of the problem here are sort of wall of gardens. When I was, you know, a top sci grad student, Citing articles from ACM Digital Library was really easy, and mm -hmm. once you get past that, it was progressively harder. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the citation section on a typical Wikipedia article, um, a lot of the, like the example you showed, a lot of the difficulty was there was a very wide variety of newspapers, uh, other encyclopedias, websites that someone saw one day. And they might not have even said which day. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, do you have any? I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on sort of how to attack the wall learn problem. How to get, you know, one tool to rule them all. Well, so um, we should talk more about this afterwards. But uh, so, so the question was, wall gardens are, are a serious problem here. How do we get around them? So there are a few answers. Uh, but one of the things I'll point out, which um, is anyone in the room a lawyer? <coughs> Good. <laughs> Good, so that means I can, I can pass myself off as something approaching legal expert. <laughs> Not. Um, so, um, my understanding is that metadata is not copyrightable. So if you can grab the metadata, even if it's off copyrighted material, you can't copyright the metadata. So, I, I want to make this very clear. I am not endorsing what I'm about to say. I'm not saying that someone should do it, but hypothetically, if, if someone were to take a bot that may or may not currently be in prototype uh, and release it behind some sort of, I don't know, paywall access system that might or may not exist at you know, several hundred research universities uh, and grab a whole bunch of metadata, uh, I, I am unaware of a way to stop such a person leaving. But I, 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 of course, this is all hypothetical, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it's, on that note, it's worth noting that it very definitely would be legal in the UK if someone behind the university say, well, to do that because of the recent exceptions to text data mining, they are explicitly to allow the capturing of citations from. So, so, so we're 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 oh, sir. Also, we're noting that it is being worked on and help is welcome. Yes. <laughs> so, so Cameron just pointed out that it is legal, and Dan just pointed out that it's happening. So, <laughs> in the UK. In the UK, yes. But um, yeah. But anyway, yes. Good. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is regarding accessibility. Um, what you've demonstrated is mainly in the form of pop-ups when a yes. when a mouse pointer goes over something. Mm -hmm. How would that actually work in, say, a situation whereby you're using a screen reader? We, would you rely on this stuff at the bottom of the page, or does it appear in my? How does it work? So, so this is this is an ongoing question. Um, there's also the question of how this would look on mobile or tablet. Um, right now, the answer to the question is this is an alpha. Um, we we thought about these things, um, but our goal was to get this out the door as quickly as possible. That being said, the information that's being displayed all over the page, the pop-ups and whatever, that's, you know, that, that interface that I showed, and I want to make this really clear, that interface that I showed is not rich citations. That is something that's built using rich citations. It's a reader interface that sits on top of class papers with the rich citation information that's coming back from the API, which will go live in a week or so. Um, that information is the information that a screen reader would want. And that information will be available in structured JSON and you know, uh, conforming to several different standards. So assuming that the screen reader has a program that can interpret JSON, people should be fine. And it's all open source as well. So if somehow that problem is not solved when this goes into beta or whatever, um, you can whip up a solution yourself. But uh, we, we would like to support that. Um, hold on. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I missed it or not, but in terms of the metadata that's currently collected with your alpha, does it have a functionality for, I don't want to use the 
word originality, but if I publish a, a conference paper and then it evolves into a book chapter, then it evolves into a, an article, is there a relation between those things? Or a way to indicate relationships between those things? And, and crucially, as a, as a former grad student, if one of those was published on a website and it's free for me to read, and the other they're not, <laughs> that's the version I'd like to look inside. <laughs> Uh, okay, so oh, do, do you have a comment? Well, more, more generally, um, can we add fields to the uh, conceptualization, maybe data database, add the Because I can think of definitely things off the top of my head that might be nice to add, including both of those. Okay, so so the the uh, huge multi-armed question that was just <laughs> asked by three <laughs> uh, <laughs> was: Is there a way to sort of indicate that two different works are versions of the same thing? And indicate which one's free, and is there a way to add fields to you know the open citation or to the rich citation uh, API essentially? Uh, is there a way to add fields to the database? Um, so in reverse order, yes, there is. Um, if it, we we can already tell whether or not something is open, sometimes uh, we're getting better at it. Uh, it, it Right now, what we're using is uh, the open access gauge, which uh, came out of loss advocacy, actually. Um, uh, but there's also license information that's showing up on Crossref, and we're, we're grabbing that as well as more people populate that information. Right now, I think the only publisher to do it is Hindawi. Foss doesn't even do it, which uh, is a shame. But um, yeah, so that, that's helpful. But in terms of versioning, that's something that could be addressed by adding extra fields. Right now, we would only in, be able to indicate that if that connection is also indicated on another database that we query, such as Crossref. Uh, beyond that, I don't think we can do that right now. What we can do in the future is that I probably should have mentioned this. Uh, I felt like it almost went without saying. Of course, all of the software here is going to be made available under an open license, probably the MIT license, and will be posted on GitHub. So you can all play with it and, and make it better to your heart's content. Um, yeah. Do you have any intention to make this as a plucky rather than a separate entity? Yes. Oh, sorry. The question was, do we have an intention to make a plugin rather than a separate entity? Uh, yes. I mean, in, in hopefully the relatively short to medium term, uh, this will be showing up as an option for viewing on the main floss page. Yeah. What are the prospects of including kind of uh, relationships uh, in within the citation process? Like I'm citing this because uh, it contradicts the, the cited paper, or, or the other way around, or it confirms things like that. Uh, according to the citation ontology, basically. Yeah. So so uh, the question was, what are the prospects of grabbing semantics? You know, why something was cited and in what way it was cited. Uh, that was one of the things we looked at early on in the project. I mean, the, the short answer to your question is uh, you can add field. Uh, and we grab, some of the information that we grab uh, is the immediate context of the citation. So we grab roughly the sentence before and the sentence after. Well, maybe a little more. It's something like 20 words on either side. And that's served up as part of the rich citation. So if you have a way to parse that, and can use that to display the way in which this was cited semantically, that's awesome. We couldn't figure out a way to do it easily. Uh, and there's been a fair amount of research done in this area which strongly discouraged us from uh, trying to do it because not only does it turn out that machines are at least not yet particularly good at this, but uh, more problematically, humans are not very good at this. Uh, it, it turns out that if you take two expert readers and give them the same paper with the same citations and have them code the citations according to a really basic citation ontology with something like only five different categories, their match rate is something between 60 and 70 percent. So it's not very good. Um, and also something like 60 to 70 percent, most of the ones that they agreed on, were coded as neutral. Um, so it's an interesting problem. And it's one which we're sort of providing the tools to attack, but we have not attacked it ourselves. Yeah? Right, so, so the ideal way would be to have something in the authoring system. 
Yes. As the author, you say, this is a great paper, or this is, I'm citing because it's completely rubbish, then um, yes. that's the only way to do it. Or, or the related papers. I'm citing this yeah. because it's the most complete version yeah. that I know of. Yeah. Or, or so you have to choose between, you have to, you have to cite it with a reason. Right. Well, so this is, this is also something we looked at. Um, and again, it would be relatively easy to add a field to accommodate that. Uh, ultimately, what we decided was, again, we wanted to get this out the door as quickly as we could. And since that would involve changing the publication workflow, we didn't want to do that. But it's flexible enough that for publishers who do do that, um, right now the most that I've seen any other publisher do is some publishers are asking authors to mark which citations are the important ones, essentially put a gold star next to a few of the citations. We can support that with another field. Um, I would love to get that information. Uh, on the other hand, if one publisher rolled that out and others didn't, there might be some people who are pretty pissed off that they had to jump through another route to publication. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't do it. It doesn't mean that the publisher shouldn't do it. Uh, it's just a problem. But I, I completely agree. Any more questions? I think we have time for about one more question. Um, very quick. Okay, thanks, Adam. That was great. Uh, that's uh, rich citations from scientific papers, and it's nice to see plus making uh, research articles more than just static PDFs. Uh, we like to do. Yeah. So, is Trevor? You Yep, exactly. Okay, so uh, Trevor, Pascal, Pascal and I will be talking about um, building client-side applications with uh, OOJS and OOUI. My name is Trevor Pascal. Um, the thing I want to talk today about has a lot to do with an architectural shift in especially our front end code, but just in our features in general that uh, I've been part of since I joined the foundation. And I, I, I think it's been a growing, growing trend and it's something that I really want to try and see more people do and take advantage of and, and join us. Um, I work on Visual Editor, as my snazzy hipster t-shirt indicates. And uh, Visual Editor being a very rich front, uh, front end application, we end up doing a lot of sort of pushing the envelope, doing more cutting edge stuff. We were only working on more modern browsers. But the support for Visual Editor is growing uh, in market share over time. And a lot of the same techniques that we have been using in Visual Editor or something that we can we can use more generally. So with that, first let's talk a little bit about browsers. So working with browsers is a bit of a gamble. <laughs> so 
Sometimes everything works as documented. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's possible to achieve, even frequently it's possible to achieve something, but you've got to be really creative. Occasionally it's not possible at all. See Internet Explorer. <laughs> and so this gamble puts us in a position where the quantity of advanced features that we include in our applications reduces our odds of success until it, until it nears zero. And uh, this, this, this is where the edge is. That's why we pull back from it just a bit and why we're not always doing um, you know, all the really cool HTML5 demos you see at conferences sometimes. That's not in production code because it's not, it's not quite there yet. But there's, an, there's another issue at hand, which is that even if you're going to bias towards the old technologies, old technologies are also going to eventually go away. So standards, pretty much as soon as they're implemented across the board, as soon as Internet Explorer finally supports it, everyone else deprecates it. So it's, you're, you're chasing this narrow window of support. And uh, you can either use this ancient technology, but not too ancient, or you can sort of ride the wave and hope to get a little bit lucky. And this is why, maybe it's because I have three kids and I see things through this lens, but I believe that browsers are a lot like small children. So every single time you give them a new responsibility, they stumble and fall, and then eventually they sort of pick themselves back up and figure it out, and this cycle repeats itself over and over again. And this is the way browsers are with new features. That every single time they implement something, they're quickly going to say, never mind, you implemented it wrong, and pull it back. And eventually they kind of come to this stasis where things actually work. And I also think of it as that we really love to watch browsers grow and learn new tricks. We spend a lot of time with them. We learn to tolerate their bad behavior. They stress us out. They give us gray hair. But most importantly, they cannot be trusted. <laughs> And speaking of not being able to trust things, I just want to talk about this for a moment. CSS Zendart, is anyone familiar with this concept? It's this, it's this horrible lie that's been told to us all. It's this idea that with just a, a, a small amount of markup, if we just look to CSS alone, that we can style the web page any way we please. And that if we're putting a lot of markup into our document, that somehow we just haven't seen the light yet, and we don't know what we're doing. But the truth is, is that that doesn't work, and that we end up putting much, much more doc uh, markup into our documents. And it's not always just adding more markup. A lot of times we have to rearrange the markup. I remember when I was implementing Vector, uh, which is the skin we all now use, uh, I noticed that Monobook, some of us use, um, I noticed that Monobook in right to left languages actually didn't output um, the language links reliably um, in, in, in right to left. It may work in the browser, it may not, depending on the browser. So we wanted to correct this and standardize it. Well, we had to actually output the HTML backwards to get that to work across browsers. It works, but, you know, I got it to work at IE 5.5. I mean, <laughs> 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 that was hard. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> so, then you have the semantic HTML concept, which is kind of a back to basics. Let's just introduce a few more tags. I'll express yourself uh, using, using fewer tags, cleaner markup, don't put tables everywhere for layout, right? And I, and I think we all kind of get on board with that, that makes sense to us. But it really, the problem is, is that this is where we end up. And this is where we really need to be to be able to achieve <coughs> the designs that we're trying to, to, to present to the user. And I, I mean, I've had, a, I've had a really intimate relationship with a lot of browsers. I can tell you that there are, there are very strange things about certain elements, like the button element, that in Firefox there is a magical amount of padding on either side of the label that you cannot remove or predict if it's there that legends in field sets are not reliably stylable because there is a margin on them that cannot be removed. And there are very strange things about many elements that we would consider to be the right element to use that actually prevent us from being able to achieve 
cross-browser compatibility, uh, or to achieve the design of hand at all. And this is why we always end up using divs and spans, because it's like the only thing we can really depend on. So beyond that, not every control uh, that we can come up with, there is a native control for. Sure, there's a, a native button and a native little drop-down menu, but what about a segmented button or pretty much any other thing you can imagine? Because the HTML form controls are pretty basic. So what about those? How do we, how do we create those? You're not going to do those with native tags either. And tell me of Shadow DOM, uh, which is another one of those new toys that the browsers are going to implement and then pull back away from and then eventually stabilize on. We're still going to be using divs and spans for quite some time. And the thing is, is that if we're building a rich application, we can annotate it with, uh, with information for accessibility. We can annotate it with information using RDFA or whatever. We don't need to rely on the structure to be our application's description of, of what it is and what it does. It's not a canonical piece of information. It's not the article. It's the tool to make the article, or it's the interface for doing something else. So screw semantics if you're making an application. And for that matter, screw the DOM. Because, I mean, we need to use it, obviously. But I'm suggesting that the DOM is very untrustworthy. And while I'm not necessarily at this precise moment suggesting that we use Canvas instead to render everything, although I may reserve the right, <laughs> we, we often depend on it, and that's exactly how we get in trouble. And here's what I mean. This is a typical application in the front end. The DOM is the center of everything. The, the data in the DOM is what we are constantly looking to as the canonical representation of the information that the user is working with. The view is the DOM content, and the controller is all the events and the way that we respond to those events that the DOM gives us. So in, in every sense, the DOM is in complete control of our application, and we are at the mercy of its insanity, and our, and our defensive position is often unable to produce a reliable result for users. And nothing proved this to me more than working on Visual Editor and working with Content Editable, which is a whole other talk that I literally gave two hours ago. And so this architecture is the architecture that we ended up with with Visual Editor. And I, and I believe that this is the only way to work with the DOM civilly. It should be used as a rendering target. We can listen to some of its events. We have to, we have to accept that often we can't take just the single event that we're going to have to abstract them. When you have a mobile device and you rotate it, how many events do we get? We get a rotate uh, change orientation event. We get a resize event, maybe even multiple resize events. We might get a scroll event, depending on what the browser starts to do. There's no way for us to really trust what the DOM says is really happening. We have to always check up on it. And we should also avoid storing data inside the DOM. This is something that, like, when jQuery had the dot data, and all of a sudden it was this huge revelation, like, the DOM will just be my whole application, and I'll just store everything in dot data, and I'll just pick it up later and select, the, select it later. But it, it, it really got us into a lot of trouble. A lot of new wiki software, even things that I wrote, wiki editor, use this technique. It's very flawed. And you get yourself into a lot of trouble. So what I'm proposing is that we use the DOM as a rendering target only. And so if the view is simply a composition of, of uh, it's a rendering, rather, of the model, and then we send it over to the DOM, what am I describing? Well, I have to admit it sounds a lot like templates, which if anybody knows me very well, they'll know that that's probably not something I'm going to suggest. Why are templates bad? So is anyone familiar with, um, with, any, with any languages that use pre-processing? So I'm going to define templating for the scope of this, because many people have sort of diluted the name. Anytime you take something in format A, that's data, and you, and you transpose information in markup in format B, and you produce markup in format C, 
I consider that to be a pre-processing. It's like it's a template processing step. So what's bad about this is you is first off you're creating a new language, and we have enough languages. Okay. Second, you're probably embedding one language inside of another language. Stop doing that. Okay. This also means you're using pre-processing in either case, and pre-processing is inherently evil. So let's consider the C language in particular. In C, is anyone who who's ever programmed in C? Yeah, good. What a wonderful language it is. You're programming about as close to metal as you can stand, and um, you can you can write incredibly efficient programs. And if you've ever used a C library that depends a lot on macros, you probably realize very quickly that the source code no longer defines in a sensible way what the what the dang library does, because it ends up being an absolute mess of intertwined garbage. I remember the, I remember trying to port free type to another language. And it was like just an exercise in futility. And this is really common in the C language because it is a power tool, or maybe it's more like a handgun, and people often shoot themselves in the foot with it. And maybe perhaps I should use an example that hits closer to home. Because in Wikitext, we have a macro language known as templates. And templates, maybe just because I work on Visual Editor and they're the bane of my personal existence. They are also quite evil. If you've ever written templates, aside from the syntax, there are so many crazy edge cases and crazy things you can do, one thing embedded in another. It just gets pretty horrendous really fast. And the fact that we weren't able to write a very efficient template pro uh, processor tells you something about how well it was designed. And in fact, Parsoid still leans on the PHP template processor. So, this isn't even just a problem of mixing grammars, although that is a big problem. Even when you do it in a very sanitary way. Has anyone used XSL before? Like on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's sanitary. It's a totally reasonable way, in quotes, to take XML and transform it into a different XML document. But here's the fundamental problem. Once you gone through that transformation step, you've lost all reference of where that stuff came from. There's no, there's no easy way to reconcile if you want to change the data. Okay? You've got to start all over. Regeneration is wasteful. Reconciliation is very complex and costly. And this is why I believe that templates are like a one-night stand. Okay? It's really quick to get going. The template processor has no problem outputting, but once it's done, it leaves you all alone. <laughs> no references to what's been created, no API for modification, no events when something is interacted with. You can either hack away at the output or start all over with different data. We've been doing this for a really long time, and it has caused a lot of I guess I'm supposed to be incorporating that slide. Too many clever animations. So what we need is something that will stick around. We need objects that provide an abstraction around the view and the controller. And they communicate, or, or rather listen to, a model, which is alive and, and, and sending events. We need these objects to be able to handle all the rendering for us. We need to have a simple way of changing that rendering, spe specifically when the model changes. And we need to know when something's happening that's interesting, uh, like when someone interacts with the text input. In, in, in fact, the on-change event of a text input is insanely unreliable. In many browsers, the on-change event doesn't even fire until you blur the, the input. Does that seem like that's when that changed? The most common way that we handle this is that we actually do a set timeout on a key down. And so when you're done pressing the key, then we wait a little bit, and then we check to see if the DOM has actually uh, admitted that it changed something, and then we evaluate the difference between them, and then we emit a stable change event that is a real indication of something in fact changed. And we need this kind of abstraction throughout the entire user interface. We need a long-term relationship. What we need are widgets. Widgets is a common term for a user interface control that combines a view and a controller. 
I've seen them called components. Really, I don't care what you call them. As long as you combine the view and the controller, and it has a long-term connection to the data. And to take this even further, whenever possible, we need to move the view from the server, where we're currently rendering it in PHP, sending it over the client, maybe doing something fancy. And I realize that this is useful for old browsers that don't have JavaScript, or there may be other cases where this, is, where this, this may be of some value. But when possible, any user interface we can, we should be moving it so that instead, we are copying the model over to the client and managing the synchronization of the model asynchronously. And then we are updating a view that lives exclusively on the client. Is, if anyone remembers when Gmail like first had this rich email application where you didn't have to refresh the page every single time you clicked anything, what a revelation that was. Well, that was like a decade ago. And we're still doing this in software that's being written at the foundation and in extensions every day. And this architectural model, I think, is, it, it, it's no longer cutting edge. It's, it's come of age. This is the time that we need to start taking it more seriously. This architectural model, it makes fewer road trips to the server. Imagine if every time you clicked a link on a wiki page, we didn't load the entire skin again, but we only reloaded the article. And we only updated all of the, you know, the language links and the tools relevant to the content that's being used. This is something that people have been talking about doing ever since I joined the foundation in 2008, which seems like a great idea. But it requires this exact architecture. It also makes it so that we can abstract the, we can abstract the information being transferred between the client and the server in a way where it's the same exact API that other people would consume if they wanted to do some other completely different client. And so we no longer have the API being sort of the second class citizen where, you know, I've heard already in this conference, well, you can't do that because, you know, the API doesn't, doesn't allow you to do it. Or we'll have to add that to the API. This would keep us honest. This would make it so if you see it on Wikipedia, it can be done through the API because we are doing it through the API. And it makes this possible to keep us our, for us to keep our widgets around for a long time. Would you believe that there are libraries in MIUI Core right now which are specifically designed to solve these very problems and they're even being used by some projects, not just Visual Editor. It's called OJS and there's another library called OEY. So let's talk, talk about OJS first. First off, it's core, basic. JavaScript gives us prototypal inheritance. OJS kind of builds on that. It uses native prototypal inheritance but it gives us a few extra things like static inheritance, stuff that people are used to writing classes, <coughs> like <coughs> Java. Um, <laughs> and it allows you to build a more traditional object-oriented systems that, that, that you know, have single inheritance, okay? We also have mixins, which are a form of multiple inheritance, although I would say it's a more defensively sane one. And uh, of course, uh, it encourages the use of composition. Um, so we're going to take those basic ways to build classes, which I think everyone in this room is probably already pretty familiar with, uh, and we can actually do it in JavaScript nicely. Um, obviously, it has an event system. We basically ported the event emitter from Node.js a while ago, and we've just evolved it, and now it's this really clean, nice uh, uh, event emitter that we really, uh, we really like using. It's designed for working with JavaScript objects between each other specifically. Um, and there's a factory model that you can extend. There's also like registries, which is sort of like a factory, except it doesn't actually manage classes. It's basically an abstraction of a map. Um, and this allows you to define functionality symbolically. And then later on, someone else can patch in different functionality, specialize it, and then you can still refer to it by a symbolic name. And this is how Visual Editor works, for instance. All of the different nodes that we, that we build the whole editing experience out of, it's all factory driven. We just register that a paragraph is done by paragraph node. But in MediaWiki, it's done by the MediaWiki paragraph node because there are special rules. And in WordPress, maybe there's different rules. And they can have a WordPress paragraph node. But the core software only knows the word paragraph. Right? This is the concept. And there's also a bunch of utilities for working with objects, which are either missing from JavaScript entirely, or they're like polyfill. And on this, we built OUI, which is the user interface library that we use throughout Visual Editor. 
and we've now completely separated it off. OUI knows nothing of visual editor, there's nothing visual editor, editor specific in it. And it's in its own repository. And so we have widgets. There's a decent library already, and they allow for displaying the information, allowing interaction. It's that, that, it's that uh, view controller combination. But a little further than that, we also have like layouts to arrange widgets and forms and grids and whatever, and also windows, which provide like modal experiences when you're trying to get a user to focus on task. And all the widgets are made up of elements, so it's a lot of code reuse. Um, because we're using mix-ins, because we're using that inheritance model that OJS gives us, uh, we're able to define what it means to interact with an icon exactly one time, and every single time in the entire user interface that we interact with an icon, we use it not just a similar or compatible method, but we use the exact same method. And it's copied all over the place using mixes. And so these elements for icons and indicators and uh, labels, which are very fundamental, they can also include things like this is a group of things, and I need an uh, API for being able to add or remove things, and events when they're added and removed, and things like that. And um, it's very promise-oriented, although it does not necessarily introduce promises. It uses jQuery promises. Uh, but it does introduce a concept of processes, which is a series of things that must be done in order. It is very promise-oriented. Um, and that's used throughout to be able uh, to handle complex sequential operations that happen to be needed by things like Windows, what happens when it opens, when it's open, when it's, open, when it's closing, when it's closed, things like that. The widget library is pretty simple. It's mostly stuff that we made ad hoc, but as I said, like all these widgets are just compositions of different elements. And so making custom widgets is usually something you can just sit down and do pretty quickly, and uh, you probably spend more, most of your time on style. We have buttons, inputs, pop-ups, menus, stuff like that. And uh, as I said about layouts, <laughs> um, we also have layouts. You can lay out simple forms, and also more complex things that you may have seen in Visual Editor. These are all done using layouts. This is not an HTML page where we dropped a few things in. This is a form layout with form layout, you know, form element layouts and all these things, and they all come together, and it's and it's easier to manage the styling because when you change the way something works, it changes it everywhere. We have the same level of abstraction for every single level. And also, like this this whole concept of this outline, this is like a paginated dialogue. So that's that's also a layout. Did you have a question in the middle? Yeah? Why buttons are above but not below? Oh, you haven't seen that new change yet? We're converging on mobile, man. We also have basic little informational dialogues. And all of, and all of these things that you're seeing, although they don't look like the, um, I guess they're calling it Agora styling, um, that's, that's being worked on right now. And so you'll be able to use these libraries within about two or three weeks from now. And uh, as long as you're within MediaWiki, they'll already automatically look like all the stuff that the design team has sort of declared is the way we want everything to look. And they'll always look that way because these libraries will be updated to stay in sync with those design changes. So you'll never be handed like a mock-up or you know, have a, a situation where someone wants it to look like MediaWiki and you are sort of a version behind or using the wrong library. This is, this is always going to be right there in step. And it also has like a way to deal with error handling with more complex dialogues. And this is all done through processes and callbacks. And, uh, or sorry, and rather than using callbacks constantly, we're using promises. And things are, things are pretty robust. We have these elements, lots of icons. You know, this stuff's always in flux. We're always adding more icons for every application. So pretty much you can use this anywhere. It's really great to use with Visual Editor because this is the UI language that Visual Editor already speaks. So anyone who's extending Visual Editor, uh, this is, the, the, you'll get a crash course in this really fast anyway. It's already in core and has been for a while. It's deployed everywhere. Um, if you want to use it for user scripts, gadgets, <laughs> all that stuff, it's, uh, it's, it's already there and ready and it's, it's, it's kept up to date constantly because uh, there are other um, high priority projects that are constantly using it. And uh, you know, we manage the code in Garrett. It's mirrored GitHub. There's NPM modules for both libraries. And uh, OJS, which is that core library that does the inheritance stuff, is actually uh, a really great Node.js library to use. Um, and uh, it works happily uh, outside of a browser. 
Um, OJS in particular, the core library, it works all the way down to IE6. It actually has greater compatibility than uh, jQuery. Uh, it works down to ES3. Uh, there's some polyfills to make that happen, but it still, it still does work. Um, OUI has a little higher uh, standards. Uh, we're working on getting it down a lot lower, maybe to IE7, at least for all the core widgets. Um, there's nothing about OUI in particular that, that limits us, but I think some of the widgets have been made without those browsers in mind because there's some styling issues and some little bugs. Uh, a lot of those things have been worked on uh, trying to get visual editors browser support wider, but there are other teams that are, um, that are needing even wider support, so we're, that's, that's becoming more of a priority. <laughs> and um, as you can imagine uh, from the names, these are JavaScript libraries. Uh, however, uh, I am working on a server-side component that can have compatible output of all of these widgets from PHP. So you can render them using an object, using the same exact properties, the same APIs, and they can then be sent to the client. Uh, where the plan is that we're going to make it possible to then revive them and turn them back into an object uh, and you'll have all the same API that you would normally have as if you created it on the client. And if you don't have JavaScript, then you just have a plain old style button. Um, all this work I'm sort of scheduled to work on in the next couple months, at the same time as the Skinner Factor, and it's all sort of integrated, so stay tuned. Um, it's, it's, it's reasonably well documented, at least some kind of getting started stuff on the wiki. Um, there's also really extensive um, Generative documentation, we use JSDoc for both libraries. Uh, we're really neurotic about having documentation for everything that's actually useful. Um, so I encourage you to see if you can get, get started uh, on, on the wiki. And I think most of all, this is a library that is still in development. And the people who use it, we are always happy to find new friends who think that the same things are important and want to try and solve the same kind of problems. And when people come and get involved, uh, we're, we're really happy to help you with your problem and see how these libraries can work better for you. And um, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? If I have any time left. Yeah, you've got time for a couple of quick questions. Can you repeat the question for more answer it? So Absolutely. No problem at all. No questions. That's okay. Oh, over here. Um, some of the things you spoke about, it sounds like it sort of overlaps with things like Meteor or Ember and these other frameworks. Have you, have you evaluated those? These the different things? So, so, okay. So first off, I didn't use the word framework. That's a good question. Yeah, sorry. Of course. I just promised I'd repeat it. <laughs> He, he mentioned some other frameworks. He's wondering if I've evaluated those and compared them and contrasted them. Um, OK, so I didn't use the word framework on purpose because um, I, I sort of believe that um, a useful library is a library that lets you solve a problem the way you want to solve it. Um, although I do think that the way I present is very opinionated, the, the honest truth is that when you use these, um, these tools, they are not very opinionated. And um, we definitely give you enough rope to hang yourself with. And uh, we're not trying to protect you, from self, or protect you from yourself. And that's why I feel like uh, we're probably not really a framework. Um, it's just a library that you can kind of do what you wish with. Um, as far as whether we've evaluated them, um, you know what, there's just so many. Uh, I can't really honestly say that I've evaluated all of them. But uh, this was definitely a response to, gosh, jQuery UI is such a piece of junk. And we need to do something better than this. And uh, that's, that's kind of where we landed. You still have a question? Yep. Yeah, um, a very silly question. Where did you get the um, the awesome sort of browser skins for your slides? Uh, <laughs> well, some of them. Repeat the question. Yeah, he wants to know where I got all the browser screenshots that go back in time. <laughs> My favorite is the Dolphin 3D one. If anyone picked up on that one, yeah, yeah, that's cute. Some good old I use in uh, in there too. Uh, some of them were painstakingly uh, taken um, from VMs and. Weird things like that. Others I found sort of a little small cache of interesting screenshots that someone had already formatted, but the big pain is getting them all to be in the same resolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, was, yeah. It, it was my copious spare time. Yes. <laughs> okay.
Okay. So well, I guess, yeah. No. No, okay. no questions. Anyway, thank you very much.
uh, of the book. So we have the titles also, and then you can, you have also the list of all pages, you can map the uh, page, for example, uh, there you can see that I think it's page, uh, page, page five of the five is page one in the book, so in the, in the book presentation. So let's come back to the presentation. So, who I am? Uh, uh, I am a wiki source contributor uh, on many of the French ones, and I'm sorry, currently they are the two page extension. I can't develop them, and I haven't developed it, sorry, but I work on it to be sure that it works well, and I do some small improvements like that. So, what we have done the past two years? First, we have continued to develop WS export. WS export is a is a magic export tool for ready source. I call it magic because you just give it, hey, I want to export this page on this wiki source, and then it goes to the page, try to extract the list of chapters if it is the main page of the book, extract metadata from wiki text, and then create uh, any curve with all this content. So it's focused only on wiki source because you have to you deal with, with wiki source metadata. So the, the, the author of the, of the content is not uh, the contributors of the wiki, but uh, someone and so, and so on. It works pretty, uh, pretty well, especially the 2 that is the old version. But uh, there is also a new experimental support for EPUB 3. EPUB 3 brings HTML5 to, uh, to EPUB, so we can, we can also make, uh, even search JavaScript things in the EPUB, but it doesn't work, in fact, anymore. Uh, with most uh, reading devices, so it doesn't, it isn't usable yet. So we have also migrated, of course, it to Wikimedia Labs. We also worked to integrate this tool in the URL user interface of uh, most of big wiki sources, even the, uh, the mobile user interface. So on um, the English and French wiki source, you have a button to just click, and you can download the paper of the current books on your and not form and then read it offline and share it. Is there is a, a quite huge number of genres, so it's, it's very nice for the source because it's not a very big website. So it works well. We have also worked to rewrite the index and the page pages editing interface because it was, was a very crappy thing written in JavaScript. So there was a non standard editing interface of MediaWiki and then using JavaScript to, uh, it was doing some very rare things to extract the editor of the page and, and create for nice forms and stuff like that. So as part of the Google Summer of 2013, we have worked to rewrite page pages editing interface. So it's normal, as I said, normal a very bad JavaScript act. But it extends now to the media editing system, so the edit page class. And, you know, there is some big advantages of this rewrite. Now the code is fairly maintainable because the JavaScript pack was so ugly that I was even not able to read it. It was awful. So it shows new media features like common handlers, so, you know, we have now a clean way to uh, implement things like. Uh, Page pages that it isn't only plain on the wiki account. Performance of our battles, of course, it works with uh, HTML, uh, with uh, browser without JavaScript anymore. So it breaks less, of course, it, there is no, so the acts are not so crappy. And, and we can also validate also the historic content when you save it, even through the API, because before it just save anything in page pages, you know, it doesn't follow the, the pattern of page pages, and so you was able, uh, were able to break everything. No, it's not possible anymore. So some other things, uh, and I was implement, implementing a new project sidebar in the Wikibase extension that's for us, um, that is yours on Wikimedia Wiki to get data from Wikidata. So it's very useful because but now in French and Italian wiki source and even I think in, in some Wikipedia that Rush, uh, like Russian one, you can just 
you have on every wiki pages, you have another project section with links that are retrieved from the weekly item connected to the page. And I think it will be also deployed in a few weeks on every wiki as a beta feature thanks to, wiki thanks to the Wikidata development team. So another thing, it's a small tool that just allows to import books to Wikimedia Commons from Internet Archive. It's very nice because people's, uh, wiki source people are used to, to use Internet Archive OCR system that is very, very good for language that, like English or French to get an, uh, an input file, a digital file, sorry, with a very nice text layer. And then the profiling works is very, very easy because the OCR is very good. So I have written a small tool to just give to it the idea of the, of the file in Internet Archive, your uh, file name on comments, and then it retrieves metadata, and and up, uh, you can edit it, and then you upload the digital view to Wikimedia Commons, and then you can create your index page on Wikisource, and then you can start profiling very, uh, in a very few minutes. So it's very nice, very better than before when you have to download the book in Internet Archive, and then re-upload it to Wikimedia Commons, and edit the page to set the book template on Wikimedia Commons. And so. so, but now what we could do to improve the source? I think there is a lot of learning aid threats that we that uh, that we can take and to improve really the wiki source editing uh, editing and uh, consuming interface. And there are most of them I think are doable by volunteers. So of course we need you. <laughs> <laughs> so some ideas. Last year uh, the wiki source community user group has done a small contributor survey that. Uh, more than 200 uh, resources source is very huge for this source. And so one of the questions was, what do you think are the core priorities for the wiki source community? So I think the answer was very interesting. The first answer was an integrated GitHub explosion. So in, in really integrated into many wiki uh, user identity, into wiki source interface. So you are everywhere in wiki source, you should be able to download and the EPUB and then use it offline. Another really important feature, requested feature is support for the visual editor, both in the main page and in the page in the next space. And there are also some very requested things like easier workflow, so better usability, localized OCR, because even if OCR works very well, in Latin based languages like English, French, or more. For Indic based languages, for example, it, the OCR are very, very crappy. So you don't even use them because the, the output is very, very bad. So it's an interesting point. So about visual editor support, there is some small text we can, uh, can try to archive. The first one is to make parser widget know where it is or something in order to be sure that you can use the <coughs> to do things. And it's nearly done, thanks to the password team. So we can currently, we will be able in, I think, in two or three weeks, your password output to create, for example, the zinc file to distribute with source offline in uh, Africa, and so on. So, but to implement our source support, we need to add support in it for tags used by Wikisource source, because there is uh, quite a huge number of tags that are used in wiki, uh, only in wiki source for like page, poem, section. And also we need of course a custom editing interface for page pages. I've tried to impl implement something. It's very, very, uh, it doesn't work currently, but there is an idea of what should be so you can edit like, the, with, uh, like a normal page. You have the scan image and can zoom in, zoom out, and do uh, things like that. So another very important thing I, uh, think, I think it's mobile support. We really need to have custom editing interface for page and text pages in order to be able to profile books directly on your mobile phone. Because currently the editing interface looks like that. So it doesn't have the scan image, so you can profile it. <laughs> and you are very aware of wiki markers. So if I if I was a new buy, I would be very afraid that I would 
I would run away from witty source. It's two or four. So we, we should really nice, nice user interface for consuming from mobile because um, other websites that provide books like Project Gutenberg have already very nice, very nice user interface. So we should really match to them. And we should maybe I think also work in gamif for gamification because proofreading is an easy task. So if you just ask our user, hey, proofread one or two sentences, I think it should work very, very well. So some of the ideas, it's like the survey uh, shows, is to integrate the API of control, maybe even in the current Wikimedia Foundation ex uh, export system based on Fastly. So it would be very, very nice to work with export effort easily inside of Wikimedia infrastructure. So now, of course, it goes Wikidata because Wikidata uh, may provide to Wikisource a nice way to manage metadata about books and also, so it would be very nice to store metadata out there and then only retry them on Wikisources. And with that, we should be able to do very easy, very uh, useful things like books for books by also or something like that. And of course, I have said before, gamification. Um, everything we will <laughs> So to conclude, what we really need now is first, of course, a stronger integrity collaboration because currently people and Wikisources do things for their Wikisources but doesn't share with Wikisources in other languages. So we should really try to improve communication between Wikisources. Now there is a Wikisource community, so the group that has is firmly that is today. So I hope it, it should really help for it. So we need, of course, people to build the Wikisource of tomorrow because there is not so much contributors and not so much technical contributors that are able to build tools um, like MediaWiki and do things like that to really customize MediaWiki and the current database for Wikisource goals, the proofread things, to share content. And of course, we need a stronger support of the Wikimedia movement to be integrated into other projects like Wikimedia Commons, Wikidata, maybe have support from the Lance community to interact with libraries that maybe and are often interested in what Wikisource do. So, the, uh, the presentation is not finished yet because some tools from the Aragon Wikisource will be just demoed. Just part it in your eyes. 
is is not being allowed. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for showing this on a screen. No, probably here you can read, but like it doesn't work on your PC yet. Anyway, I think it's great. Uh, another tool of Sunway is uh, user script and some server side software, which will allow you just to crop out images of, from books and easily approve them to comments without downloads. A separate page, or can your editor, uploading it back to comments, etc. Just in edit page, you can source, you can just drag it, uh, put some information, uh, like here you can select categories, name it. Uh, the description fills your own comments and add the and then can be used on any product. And uh, then there, there are a like, few more tools uh, targeted for helping proofread it. One of the most simple tool, but I find it quite actually useful is what I call a painter. You put a set of rules uh, which uh, like which highlights mistakes. Uh, all uh, frequently uh, seen in OCR software because it produces the quite specific mistakes. And uh, by set of rules, you just can go to the next issue and well, scroll to the page. Yeah. And it will just find it on page and invite your attention to exactly that page. And uh, there are also uh, tools, quite some tools, which are useful when you digitize. Reference books, dictionaries, encyclopedias. Basically, when on one page you have a lot of uh, sections, different separate articles, and you want to separate them, uh, we actually have a like, server side solution for that that transcludes a lot of sections Thomas mentioned, uh, but it takes some more work, manually work, to separate them and then to get all index of such sections. And this tool will allow you to easily mark a section. I'll just try to find. Some article. Yeah, let's say this one. Basically, uh, this part is just bold, nothing new, but this is a uh, name of section. And later, it will allow you to grab all the sections from the whole group, get the index, create those pages with board, etc. etc. So, this is a short demo, and I think you can finalize your section. So, if you have any questions,
uh, already published content on the web so that you make every, uh, everybody able to read or, uh, or publish content. It may be all books, but it may be also uh, scientific articles that are in the public domain or in compatible best places. But you are ready to um, print the wiki source, you have mostly profiling work from scans and OCR in order to make everybody able to read books without having to go to the library. Okay, I think, um, thank you, Adam, Trevor, Thomas, and Alexi. <laughs> so now there's a um, photo session on the water side, which is uh, down the hall.